All right, so just a quick reminder of our next webinar date, um, which is going to be December 19th. It's on a Tuesday, so make sure to mark your calendar so you don't miss it. The topic is going to be weapons mitigation technology and best practices. I'm really excited for that one. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and get started. This is the Command Pod, a monthly event safety webinar that is brought to you by Jaffe Emergency Services. Um, welcome to episode three, Risk Management in the Event Safety Context. I am Liz Rupert, and I will be your host for today's webinar. All right. For today's webinar, we're going to be breaking it down into three sections as usual. First, we're going to start out with brief introductions, and then we're going to dive into the topic for today and discuss the key aspects of risk management as a vital event safety principle. Um, rounding out the conversation, we are going to open the floor to you, our valued participants, for your questions. Let's see. We would really love to hear your thoughts and questions, so please feel free to use the Q&A feature that is enabled as part of this webinar anytime throughout the presentation to submit your questions. We are really excited to announce our event safety hub, which has just launched, and you can sign up for free membership at the hub and stay up to date on the latest command pod happenings. Um, you can also check out past episodes and access resources for all things event safety. So we would really like to encourage everyone to visit our hub and set up your free membership. All right. And don't forget to stay in touch between webinars. Be sure to follow us on social media to catch all the latest updates and information from Jaffe Emergency Services. You can catch us on the event hub on Facebook, on Instagram, Twitter, and also on LinkedIn. We also are going to share with you um, All Clear, Lessons from a Decade Managing School Crisis, which was written by Jaffe Safety Expert and emerg Jaffe Emergency Founder slash CEO, Chris Jaffe. Um, and in the book, he shows district and school leaders how to create safety in school environments and develop a plan for responding effectively in the event of an emergency, whether it be from an allergy attack or an active shooter. You can order the Book now for pre-order at Barnes and Noble and Amazon via the link. All right. So just a little bit about us. Um, I am Liz Rupert, a safety consultant for Jaffe. I work primarily in the field of school safety, but I also have um, a wealth of knowledge that I feel lends itself to events as well. And my event brain continues to grow um, the more opportunities that I have to listen to our fabulous experts and Alex. Um, Alex is the National Director of Event Safety here at Jaffe Emergency Services, and he is our resident safety expert. Our special guest for today is the fabulous Wayne Middleton. Wayne is a risk and safe Wayne is a risk, safety and security expert in public venues, events, sports, and entertainment with over 35 years experience as a venue operator, risk professional, and consultant. He's held previous roles, including ma manager of safety for the Sydney 2000 Olympics, the 2002 Salt Lake Winter Games, and has consulted to public venues and major events all over the world. He is the founder and owner of Australia and New Zealand-based risk consultancy, Reliance Risk, and is the founder of event management event risk management software risk manager that was acquired by Momentus Technologies in 2022. He is currently the global vice president for risk with Momentus and is based in Sydney, Australia. Um, Momentus is the largest global provider of venue and event software in the world. Wayne is the current chair of the Institute of Venue Safety and Security in Australia and is on the guest faculty for the Academy of Venue Safety and Security hosted by IAVM and is an instructor in the risk and is an instructor in risk at the venue management school for the venue management association asia pacific wayne also holds a masters in risk management a bachelor in administration and a diploma in security risk management we were thrilled to be able to meet with wayne last week in order to record at a time that works with his schedule we are so thankful that he was able to join us and are pleased to present this interview to you this morning Please stick around after the interview as Alex and I will be answering your questions. We will also share your questions with Wayne and read his responses on episode four. Wayne, thank you so much for being here with us today. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, Liz. Nice to see you again. 
You too. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of our audience is going to know you and your work. Um, but for those of you who might not, um, can you share a little bit of, a little bit with us about your journey into risk management and uh, what motivated you to specialize in this area? Uh, I'll give you the short version. Um, I've been in the industry for about 35 years. I started as a facility attendant uh, working in a stadium and arena in in Canberra in Australia. I live in Sydney, Australia. And uh, I did about 10 years in, in various roles within the Australian Sports Commission. So I've got a, a lot of exposure to sort of elite sport, if you like, uh, as well as uh, taking on roles there with health and safety and risk management and the public liability program. So an opportunity came up in 1999 to work on the Sydney Olympics as the Sydney uh, safety manager for the games. And it was kind of a, a baptism of fire, to be frank. Um, you know, a games would take seven years to organise, and I, I appreciate the LA Games is is bearing down on on you guys. Um, and I had a year and a half, so um, you know, the games is the biggest show on earth. They call it. Uh, you know, twenty eight competition venues, uh, twelve to fourteen non comp venues, so forty venues. Sydney Olympics had a workforce of 110,000 people um, and a lot of those volunteers and contractors, six and a half million people turned up. Um, so, you know, it was kind of a, a baptism of fire. And to be honest, everything after that's been smaller. So um, it's been easy. I was the director of safety for the Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City. I went over there for a consulting job and they asked me to stay, which was nice. Uh, and then I've continued on working in that space. So I kind of fell into it, to be honest. Uh, you know, I came from the health and safety background. I went and did a, a master's in risk management in early 2000s, uh, which the more I learned about risk management, the more I realised that I didn't know. And yet, ironically, so many people still struggle with the concept or, or treat it as common sense. And, it, and, and it's far greater than that. So... Uh, unfortunately, I, I've seen the industry and the concepts around how risk has evolved over the years. And obviously, it's become more of a, a thing, if you like. It's a term that's recognised. It's a legitimate discipline in event planning and delivery. Uh, it's not just insurance. Um, and depending upon which part of the world you're in, it means different things to different people. In the US, it's very safety and security focused. It used to be very insurance focused. Um, but it, it's even broader than that. And so um, I get the opportunity now as the global vice president of risk manager software in Momentous Technology. So we're a big multinational um, technology business. We do a lot of work in public venues and events. And I get to see how, you know, different places deal with the issue of risk. And it's, it's whilst the concepts are the same, it, it's, it changes in every space. So um, that's kind of a short version of it. Uh, I now get the opportunity to talk to people like yourselves, uh, do a lot of presentations uh, around the world, um, and it's terrific that people are, are talking about it. That was the short version. Wow. I would love to hear the long version. That's amazing. We're on a hard stop in 45, right? So. Yes, <laughs> yes. Another day. But um, we have had yeah. the opportunity to attend one of your fabulous presentations, and um, I highly recommend it to anyone that hasn't had a chance. Anytime um, Wayne and Momentus are in your area, you should definitely check it out. It's well worth your time. But thinking about, you mentioned that risk management is defined differently in different localities and the concepts have sort of changed over time. How would you define risk management today, particularly in the context of event planning and management? Well, there's some international standards that set out um, as a guidance, the process and really risk management is about being able to demonstrate that you've gone through a process. Even if it, even if we're talking about liability, it, you know, when you're defending your position in court, uh, you still need to be able to demonstrate that you've you've thought through that you're not just ticking the box, right? And there's been so many examples that we could all list of where risk management um, boils down to a box ticking exercise and that it was flawed or it failed. You know, the, the Manchester bombing, for example, from, from a few years ago and the inquiry that's followed um, was very clear that that was one of the, the faults there. Um, that standard, the international standard ISO 31000 
is recognised globally um, and even the Department of Homeland Security in the States uses the same process, even though they don't state that standard is their foundation standard, it still talks through this, the, the process of understanding the problem, coming up with what, what are the threatening elements of that, whether they're hazards or things that can affect the success, measuring them in terms of their size uh, and their magnitude of risk, evaluating them against, excuse me, some sort of criteria, and then coming up with a range of treatments. And we're either trying to stop the thing from happening in the first place, or we're trying to minimize its impact, or we're trying to transfer it to somebody else, or we decide that after that process, it's we're good to go. So that in a nutshell is, is the process of risk management. And then it, it gets overlaid by depending upon which domain we're talking about, whether it's safety and security, and then we're talking about threat actors and vulnerability and threat, or whether we're talking about safety <clears throat> and health and safety, where we're talking about hazards or, or, or frequency of exposure and duration, or we're talking about event-related risk, which is just anything that can threaten the success of the event. The same process applies. There's a slightly different lens and different tools that you can use to do it, but it's largely the same process. So once you understand that, it becomes a very valuable tool to take it from box ticking to something that is more, it can be compliance driven, or it can be a decision-making tool to help you get, where can we get best bang for the buck? We can't do everything. So what are, the, what are the things that can hurt us the most? And then how much do we need to spend in terms of cost benefit to bring that risk down? That's all within risk management. So again, it depends on the lens that people apply it to, um, but you know, all organizations need to manage risk, right? And our reputation is important. It's, it's, hard to build and quick to lose. And if nothing else, you know, we should be looking at risks uh, and you only need to open the paper or watch the news every night. There's plenty of examples of people or organizations that haven't managed risk very well. So it becomes a process to help making good decisions. I really think it's fascinating that you um, describe risk in a way as a process, right? Because I think that it's really easy to fall into that trap of thinking of it as being an end state like we are risk managing versus, you know, a process that you're going through that involves mitigation and strategies. Um, Alex, I, I'm curious, and I think that you can both weigh in on this in terms of what do you think are some of the most common uh, risks that event safety planners or event managers are going to encounter? And then how do they even begin to prioritize what's important? Yeah, um, Wayne, I'm going to jump in before you get started, because I feel like your input is going to be more robust than mine. But I wanted to as I heard the question, uh, Wayne said something, and it, it's funny, as you asked your question, I realized that I'm going to be limited by my experience, which is heavily uh, medically medical and, and security driven. Um, and Wayne said it perfectly that a lot of times people think about risk management as a security function. And mm -hmm. and uh, for event planners or or for event organizations, promoters, venues, um, they lean heavily on strictly security folks. And the back part of what Wayne was just talking about is, you know, safety um, and, and like reputational risks. And that those are some things sometimes that security folks that are leading the charge off and aren't thinking about. And then, right. if, and then if you leave it to strictly security folks, they're going to approach it from a security lens. And uh, Wayne and I had a very interesting conversation about, about this dynamic in the event industry. And, um, and one thing I realized is that I'm limited in, in what I can bring to the table when we talk about the risks for an event by my own experience. So this is very much a collaborative effort. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious to hear what Wayne considers some of the common risks uh, and, and how to prioritize them. From my experience, uh, we're, security folks are always thinking about um, threat actors more than, than hazards typically. Um, and I say always, I, that's a big word. Regularly thinking about threat actors people that are that are wanting to do harm intentionally um you think about you know your your explosive type threats your active shooter type threats um violence is what was what where my mind always goes and 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 those aren't the most common risks if you if you talk about like how often it happens but that's where my mind goes and i think that for the folks that that uh do the the work in events similar to me that's where we go and so uh, it is important to, to to think and recognize that there's so much more to risk management than just safety and security. And then also, sorry, than just security. And I'm going to let Wayne talk about that because safety and security are not the same thing. No, they're not. 
uh, there's about 10 different answers I could respond to in what you've just said, but let me let me give you the brief, the brief version. So, so many times I've seen this and you see this in major events, right? Se security is a very important element of, of major event planning. Um, and if you diagrammatically drew all the functional areas that need to deliver uh, components of what ends up being a successful major event, so often I see that security ends up being in the center, that's the largest circle. And what that does is compromises the customer experience, you know, makes big queues, a magnetometer backs. Now I understand that we need to do all that, but it's a fine line that we balance between, um, you know, not have, being remembered by the security cues and and the, the the overreach that we often see and th that happens it depends on you know who, who is running security whether it's it's event based or whether it's law enforcement based and the people that are uh, the background of the people that are running that and their understanding of venue and event delivery I think that's an important component that it, that, that we strike the balance we get it right between um what are we here to try and achieve and how can we do it in a safe way? Yes, you're right. Safety and security are separate. There's some overlap. Emergency management is one part. Risk assessment is another part where there's overlap. But safety typically has some compliance elements to it. In the US, you have OSHA legislation, which is employer-employee related, um, but doesn't relate to third parties. Only civil action relates to third parties. In my country, in New Zealand and the UK, that law also applies to the public. So the responsibilities and duties that I have under health and safety laws also make me focus on security because it's part of that compliance requirement. It's separate in the US. And this is why I say it varies depending upon where you are and, and what the regulatory framework is. Now, to go back to your point about there's different types of risk assessment, and you mentioned you know, your, your lens uh, to a certain extent has been security, but also in medical. And the whole domain around medical-based risk assessment is a is is a well-documented, well-researched uh, approach to getting best value out of the people that you put on the ground based on the level of risk. So you're going to put different people and different number of people, different qualifications of people for a music festival out in a field as opposed to where you are at a stadium that's a lower risk event. So being able to establish the context of what it is and in, in the case of medical based risk assessment, what is the distance from you know the local hospital and 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 what are the the likely scenarios are we like to have likely to have large you know um, drug and alcohol affected people? You know what are the predominant drugs that we think we're likely to encounter? All those things come into um, what are the risks that we're likely to need to address and how can we best do that? Um, so the, to go back to your question, Liz, about what are the common risks? Well, it depends, right? So if we're talking about the stuff that's very likely, uh, slip, trip and falls, they'll be between 50 and 70% of the things that you encounter on a regular basis. People are inherently clumsy. They'll slip and trip over their own feet. Uh, they'll slip and trip over food or drink spills. We all know that as venue operators, but it's also from a, a finance side, that's what dominates so much of our public liability claims. Mm -hmm. right? but, and mm -hmm. conversely, we also know if we're hosting it outdoors, we know climate change is an evolving uh, problem that's getting worse. Uh, so adverse severe weather is something that we all know that we need to plan for. We all know we're going to have medical emergencies. Um, we can't stop people from having heart attacks and, and or, or other major um, medical related concerns, statistically, it's always going to happen. And when we're inviting a large, effectively a large community into our care, we're feeding them, feeding them alcohol and then sending them on their way, things are going to go wrong, right? So we know that we need to have a sound medical response plan and that we do what we can to stop things that we contribute to those medical conditions. Um, that business continuity was something that's come out of the back of COVID. We all know now that there are things that can come from nowhere that can really affect us. So understanding what our critical business functions are that can knock us in the backside. We've just had in Australia, one of our major, major telecommunications companies gone to its knees for 16 hours, 10 million customers affected. Uh, you know, it's, it's brought the country to a standstill to a certain extent, you know, so understanding what the critical threats are 
that can affect the operational disruption, medical related provisions, doing what we can to stop it, doing what we can also to transfer some of that liability to other people and understanding what good practice is and making sure that we meet that standard because that's the sort of test that gets pressured in a court. I'm yeah. going to pause there because we're going to run out of uh, time for other questions, but there, there is a lot to it, right? Or it should be based upon the context of whatever the venue and event is, but understanding there are some minimum requirements for stuff like that, of course. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I wouldn't necessarily expect a simpler answer. We'd love a simpler answer, but when it comes to safety, security, risk, anything along those lines, if it's if it seems simple, you're probably missing something. That's People what often think. want the magic pill. And, right, exactly. You know, yes, we. it's the compromise between making it simple enough so that it's not such a pain in the backside that it just gets too hard. And that's the challenge that we have. As an industry, we want to get more sophisticated, but as the users, we want it simplified because we don't have a lot of spare time to do risk management. So it's this constant trying to find the balance between making it efficient and getting value out of it and not making it too burdensome to the point where it's a pain in the backside. And that's when you get it as a box ticking exercise. It's somewhere in the middle. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing that I've kind of noticed in my work is that it's easy to, or it is more straightforward to list all of the risks and the concerns. It gets to be really tricky and really difficult when you start thinking, okay, what are the priorities that are involved? Especially if, as Alex mentioned, if you're having a collaborative engagement or discussion with multiple different areas, there can be a lot yeah. of competing interests in terms of assessing what comes first. Right. Well, that's a good example, right? So in, in my view, if you were going to walk into a group I would come up with two thirds of the answer already, what my priorities are, what I think your priorities are. And then I would put that on the table rather than walking in to say, what do you think? Because that turns into a very long conversation as opposed to verifying a current list of priorities is a far quicker way of doing it. So that's an example of, you know, how do we get efficiencies with getting the consultation that we need, but also getting an outcome that is useful, is, is doing the homework beforehand so that you're not you know, blue sky planning, as we call it, that you're actually giving people most of the answer and they're verifying and assuring that, yes, we've got that right, or maybe the priorities are slightly different. And if they are different, why are they different? And maybe we've got it wrong. But that's that's an example of a process of looking for efficiencies to get to a, a risk-based outcome. I think that's really smart. I think that's really valuable advice. Um, so going into the Wayne files, right? And, and Alex as well. I'm, I'm interested in hearing an example to sort of make it, these processes concrete. If you could take us through an experience that you have in terms of recognizing a risk and you know assessing the likelihood and developing a mitigation strategy, I'm really curious to hear some of those stories. We, uh, one of my past lives was a consultant and I've done thousands of those projects. Uh, I, I think it'd be better to give you an example of one where that didn't happen, that I wasn't involved yes. with. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and people can search this up. But there was a, a an event called Racing the Planet. Uh, Racing the Planet mm -hmm. is a it's like an ultra marathon held in remote parts of the world, and they held, hosted one about oh, over ten years ago here in northwestern Australia. Now, if you can imagine a map of the US, Australia is the same size as the US. We have 25 or 26 million people. Uh, so there's lots of areas where there's no people. And right. in the northwest of Australia, that's a long way from everywhere. It's one of the most remote parts of the world. If you look at it on the map, it's kind of the opposite side to New York. The nearest major town is, is you know, hundreds, if not thousands of miles away. So um, they what hosted... Could go wrong? Sorry? What could go wrong? Well... It, and even if it did, where's the help going to come from, right? So anyway, this event was hosted. Uh, they invited people to come and do this 100-mile um, run or something along those lines. Uh, people paid money. They got their own way there. Um, the event organiser based in Hong Kong, was. Uh, they received some funding from the West Australian government. Anyway, they didn't sell as many tickets as they were hoping. They didn't consult the local fire authorities that they mm -hmm. were suggested that they should do. And of course, there are many fires burning in various uh, locations in the region. 
and you know weather patterns changed and some of the runners got caught in these fires uh, okay. so uh, four of them got terribly badly burnt uh, it took hours and hours to find them and then to recover them uh, nobody died so there's no coroner's inquest but there was a, a, a an inquiry that found fault with the event organizer they didn't consult again going back to my point before about consultation how important that is in in doing risk management um, they didn't assess the risks properly and, and of course their emergency response plan was flawed and it took a long long time to get people out uh, and as a result there's one woman in in particular her name is Turia Pitt and she's been an absolute champion of many causes here in Australia if you searched her name uh, she received an ex gratia payment she's terribly disfigured now from the burns um, and you know it's a terrible outcome and as a result now in Western Australia every event that's hosted in Western Australia and Western Australia is a third the size of the US every event that's hosted there and now has to have if it's government funded or government subsidized has to have a, an independent risk assessment undertaken or someone verifying that's a professional to say yes it meets that standard that I mentioned before now that's a huge change from where we've been but they did that because they didn't assess the risks properly it wasn't well documented and as a result there were people that were badly injured and it had a major flow on effect across the country and that's another important point is the collateral damage from any major incident doesn't just affect that individual or that company or that event organizer it doesn't just affect the region it affects all of us and we're a global industry and you can think of many incidents that have occurred around the world where it ends up we end up talking about it and it ends up you know challenging the perceptions that our our patrons have of us you know have we got our act together in relation to safety and security as a result of something that's happened on the other side of the world so the bottom line is we should always be learning from these things and always pushing to get better at the way we manage risk sorry Absolutely. that was a short answer sorry i sort of went on a little detour in there but it's a really good example it was a you know watershed moment in this country about the importance of risk management and risk assessment yeah i think that that's a fantastic example i love that i mean it's a tragedy that we have to have those things happen in order to take significant steps forward right but i think that um at least that does happen right that we're not repeating yeah. the same mistakes, that we're creating that level of accountability. And I think that uh, it's really beneficial. And unfortunately, from time to time, we do see that we've gone back to the bad old days where for whatever reason, and usually it's about dollars, uh, right. where people decide that, you know, we, we're we spending money on, on risk management and we can't see the outcome of that. So let's not spend it. Um, and it's only, we see the outcome when it, <clears throat> When, when the incident happens or it ends up on the balance sheet um but you you can't always see the risk right um risk can be invisible and you only see the outcome of the risk and that's part of the challenge that we have in convincing you know bean counters uh, the money people in our organizations of why we need to take it so seriously and it, going back to if nothing else the reputational risk and the outcome of when we get it wrong has such a major impact and that has a commercial outcome that's adverse alex you want to th do you have anything that comes to mind when you're thinking about examples so we've heard of an example where it doesn't work or it's not done appropriately and and there are really unfortunate consequences but can you think of something in, in where it did go correctly so we can kind of compare and contrast yeah um so there's there was a uh, music festival that we participated in and um, the area was known to have communications uh, gaps. So the cell service was not great. Um, the The layout of the festival made it difficult for radio, for, for traditional radio communications, um, even with the repeaters and in, a, in an elevated position, it was still hard to reach certain areas. And so going in that was a known factor and so there was a robust communications plan drafted based off of the risk that it would be it would be a critical failure if um the well everybody event operations um first responders 
all the folks. If they, if we couldn't talk to each other, you know, then then you're going to have problems. You you you, you can't implement proper um, show stop procedures. You can't respond to things appropriately. Um, even down to food and beverage, you can't deliver ice across the the, the facility, the, the the campus, the footprint. If you know, you can't tell somebody else, and and so the, it ended up um, the worst thing ended up happening, which was that cell phones weren't working and then the radio system wasn't working. And thankfully the organizers had, uh, I think this much, I don't know how to say the thing after tertiary, a quartiary probably. Quaternary, I believe. So the fourth plan, the fourth option four uh, had to be used. And thankfully there was an option four, which was a separate um, vendor to, to facilitate another radio system to sort of overlap the the one that was working and then you've got two radios and you from this range to this range you're on here and from that range to that range you're on a different one and so um it got to that point and thankfully uh it, it was troubleshooted troubleshooted it, it was it was worked through and um and that was because there was a known issue you knew ahead of time you you uh we checked the the area thoroughly you understood what the footprint was going to look like accounted for the fact that there were going to be x amount of attendees draining the the cell phone towers and and causing traffic uh, there was there was a deployment of of um a service called firstnet which is designed around first responders and it's like a dedicated broadband hmm. i'm using these words but i don't know that that's exactly right but it's a dedicated area of network for for this net for these uh first responder uh, devices and so that had been deployed to, to counteract some of that. But even with that, there were so many people that they were just impacting all the networks that thankfully there was a thought that went all the way to that point. And, and we got there and we had to use it and everything worked like it was supposed to at that point. Um, but that's an example of where somebody really thought it through and was like, this could happen. And if that happened, here's number two. And then if that's not working, here's where three comes in. And then, uh oh, looks like we got to number four. And I think there was probably smoke signals was number five and we, were, we didn't get there. Uh, but, but it was, it was a great, it was a great example of, uh, when I saw forward thinking and, and planning ahead of time, um, where, where it worked. That depth of planning is really amazing, right? So kudos to those event managers for having that depth of planning and that sense of scope. Wayne, do you think that how deep you need, like whether you need to get to four or five or six plans, is that influenced at all? Do you think by, um, the severity of the impact or the increased likelihood of the risk? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, I mean, planning for an event like that, if it's a cyclical event or there's a, an event that's similar that's been hosted before, starts with a debrief from the last one, really. I love it's, that. <laughs> you know, where, where were our vulnerabilities? Where were the gaps in the system? Where were there risks that we didn't know about? Or, or that we had underestimated and, and we thought it would happen maybe once and it happened 10 times, again, going back onto the likelihood, or we thought that that you know, particular failure had limited impact, but actually we were offline for, for two hours. You know, our FPOS system or our scanning system allowed us to not be able, we had to go back to cash or whatever the, whatever the, 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 the impact is, again, starts with a debrief. I think though, the challenge that people have is writing stuff down. People, you know, I hear all the time examples of like what Alex has discussed where someone knew that there was a problem. So we went away and we did all this, this planning, but the risk assessment and risk management is about being able to demonstrate you've been through the process. So actually documenting where those holes were and then measuring those or understanding what the impact of those could be and that then forms the basis of what those plans are. Can we stop it from happening? And if we can't stop it, then what are our response plans? Now, I've got a very broad view. In the US uh, in particular, uh, venue and event organizers are very good at response planning. You know, it goes all the way back to you know, September 11 and be before that we've been you know, forced into a situation where we need to have well-documented response plans. And what I'm saying is, we can actually stop a lot of stuff happening um, to a certain extent by shifting the focus on prevention as well as preparedness. And the larger the risk, the more um, diversified our risk control should be. And that should 
we should overlay that with a level of assurance, a, a way of checking. So what are the things that we can do to check to make sure that what we said we were going to do, we're actually doing? Because that's another way to end up, um, you know, having having egg on your face in a court of law is by having a document that said you were going to do something, but you didn't go and check. You know, we didn't do an audit of uh, our magnetometer and bag checking to make sure that we weren't just letting people through. You know, we, we, we needed to check to make sure that the people that are sitting in the control room monitoring CCTV are actually there and they're actually picking up things that are suspicious. You know, doing penetration testing, um, you know, red teaming, um, doing external auditing, uh, all of those things are important. Having independent people that are actually working during the event who are taking notes of things that they can see. And if there's a problem that's significant, they raise it straight away. But if not, then they're building that report out so that we have an independent set of eyes that has no conflict conflict of interest that can provide us with another set of inputs so that we keep getting better. And that's another concept um, of risk management is continuous improvement, that we don't keep making the same mistakes over and over, either our mistakes or repeating the mistakes of other people. And that means having a group that comes together that has all those inputs and then discusses what have we learned and then what do we need to change. Uh, readiness and contingency planning is another. So, you know, major events often do desktop exercises or simulations and then have other layers of are we ready? Are there checklists that we have to fill out before we can open the gates? Has somebody gone and checked in every fire cabinet that the extinguisher is in there with a pin in it? You know, have we checked every egress that it's not locked or that people haven't stored chairs and tables in a fire exit? All those things are important and all of them are levels of assurance and verification to make sure that what we had in the plan were actually go and do. So am I right in thinking that if, if you are part of an organization or if you're running an organization where there's a lot of hesitancy in capturing those actions, those after action reports and those lessons learned, that if you go back and and really lean heavily into the quality assurance of the process while the event is ongoing, that that will release some of that hesitancy to capture that action after action data. I'm seeing that there might be kind of a connection between demonstrated history of of attentiveness and thoroughness and you know willingness to capture some of those failures. I think people are so fearful of the liability associated with writing stuff down that right. they would prefer to bury their head in the sand and not do that check. Uh, and I see that a lot. But if you scratch under the surface of liability claims in the United States and how to demonstrate whether someone was negligent or not, it 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 takes into account, well, how often does that particular loss occur and what is the significance of that loss and what are the known ways of dealing with that threat or the, the cause of that loss? Uh, what is industry good practice? All of those things are the same concept as risk risk management. It's, you know, can you demonstrate that you've thought about the things that can go wrong, that you've assessed them based upon likelihood and consequence, that you've documented a way forward and that you've checked to make sure that what you said you were going to do, you do. Now, it's what is reasonable, okay? We can't we can't be there checking everything, but if you never check anything, then there's a gap, right? So what's the sweet spot that satisfies the, the reasonableness? And that depends. It depends on your funding. It depends on the complexity of the problem. It depends on how big the risk is. But again, you can't check everything. But if you don't check anything, there is clearly a gap. And if you don't check anything, your defence is getting harder to be able to demonstrate that you were doing everything that was reasonable. If no one ever went and had a look, if you had nothing written down, well, I'm sorry, Your Honour, that's kind of hard to defend. So yeah. that's that's the challenge we have, right, is to find that sweet spot of an agreed assurance process and you stick to the plan. Um, we have to take risk. We have to. Or we wouldn't open the doors, right? We wouldn't invite the people into our care. That's part of the industry that we're in. So it's about taking the right risks and having a process to demonstrate that we've thought about it and we're doing what's reasonable and what is good practice. That makes a lot of sense. So thinking about making it accessible and trying to find that sweet spot of reasonableness, I feel like technology is a great way that we can boost what's reasonable and feasible. Um, 
I'd like to know more about what you both have seen in terms of what resources and tools event safety managers and event managers can use when they're planning and going through the risk assessment process. I'll let Alex go first, if you like. Or sure. Alex, would you like to see? What's your dream list? Yeah, um, so the first thing that comes to mind um, is the, the use of incident management systems uh, to track incidents that occur. Uh, so when Wayne talks about getting the context, right, we, earlier in, in this webinar, we talked about uh, the common risks. Incident management systems um, change the game because it's so much easier to, to pull data and say, well, this many of this incident occurred um, and this or this many of this loss occurred. And when you have that data, you can look at now, we can answer what are the common risks that we have at, at our events? Um, and if, you know, for example, a, a stadium that that serves, let's say, two functions in it, and it has a, a tenant, which is, um, or owned by the team that plays a certain sport, and then the off time they're doing concerts, those are two different risk profiles. And they can look at the data for their sports games and say, these are the most common risks, and we can plan for those. And then they can look at the data for, the you know bundle up the concert types or genre types or however they decide to to say these are similar and look at that data so that's that's i think one of the biggest ways that technology can change the game for for a venue is is effective use of an incident management system now i've also seen where everything gets thrown into an incident management system and then nobody looks at it um it's just if if a claim comes up okay let's pull up that incident and who was there and what happened but there, there's not always a, a review of at the summary level, this many slip trips and falls, this many um, heat exhaustion cases. These are all medical, right? But like heat exhaustion type things. And then were they related to to the context of the event? Was it hot that day? Was 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 it raining? And so we had a ton of slip and falls. Uh, you know, those and you can look at those factors. Um, there's not, I think, as much of that as there is on the claim side, people thinking we got to get all the details into this incident in the in the incident management system so that when we get a claim, we can answer questions about it. And so it's just as important to do that as it is to to then look at your data and say, well, what does this mean for future? That's 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 the one of the ways that I've seen technology completely transform the game. And and then also um, I've seen Wayne it is hopefully is going to talk here about risk manager. Um, and that's that's a totally different uh, for planning stuff, but I'll let, I'll let Wayne get into that and other things that he has seen from a technology standpoint. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, so, I mean, technology is changing the nature of the customer experience, right? From artificial intelligence um, for, you know, how you engage with websites and social media to, you know, what you your game experience is at, at the event with the way that you're, you know, location services is understanding where you are and where you're moving around the venue. And um, and then on the security side, having, you know, facial recognition, which uh, is a double-edged sword because we also see there's a lot of issues around uh, protection of people's privacy, but also there is technology out there, um, some that was developed here in Australia, in fact, that looks at things like um, average crowd mood which is taken from a type of facial recognition without understanding the individual, but more so whether I'm happy, whether I'm neutral or whether I'm sad. And then how is that collectively um, overlaid with how fast is the group as a crowd moving and how dense is that crowd? So, I mean, that's just, just one example. To go back to your point about incident management, I, I agree. Um, you know, incident management is a good starting point. Um, but the analysis of how many is is not the is not the true risk factor because that doesn't take into account with how significant those particular trip and falls were and how often the significance occurred and what was the context. You talked a little bit about that, but all those factors come into play there. We might have had lots of incidents, but they all might have been very minor. Um, and therefore, do we really need to do something? I'm not sure. But again being able to overlay that with risk as opposed to just looking at a frequency of incidents is important. It's a slightly different lens, looking at consequence and frequency or likelihood 
uh, and then trying to interpret that against an evaluation criteria of how important that particular problem is. You mentioned uh, risk manager, of course, so um, that that's a product that's very close to my uh, heart. Uh, Momentus obviously acquired um, that from my uh, business last year, and now I'm heading up that um, that globally. And Momentus is a is a is a tech business that does a whole range of, of technical solutions for public venues and events, which is another conversation for another day. But um, uh, you know. Risk Manager, for example, helps not only on the incident and incident management side, but also on the risk and risk assessment side. And it allows you then to look at different types of risk um, and then using them to help make good business decisions. Again, allowing you to compare reputational risks with financial risks, with operational disruption based risks, with compliance based risks, with health and safety and security based risks, uh, which you know, as you said, each risk professional might only have that particular lens, but our governance bodies, our, our executive and our board, they need to be able to compare the different types of risk to make good decisions. So that's what the tool helps organisations do and to do it in a relatively simple way. Yeah, and, and Wayne, I appreciate you bringing, taking what I was saying and, and going further with the, that it's not just about like how many, it's not just tallies. It's how big are the, the tallies, how was the impact? And um and 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 it, what's interesting is with risk manager, I did get a chance to Wayne and I have had a chance to to talk through this a lot and and I've seen risk manager do what it does. And and one of the neat things is about is about the weighting that is built in that allows, like you said, the the folks, if it's the board or if it's a committee that's developed to to decide what the risk tolerance is and what what we are prioritizing and so on uh what was neat about watching about risk manager was how you can change the weights of the different risks uh, based off of things like severity um consequence and and likelihood and so um so that was really neat to see that's again i saw it specifically with risk manager but that's that's another way that technology transforms the way that that we can plan for this because it's a, it's a, doing it by hand, you know, it, it could be exhausting. Uh, but when you have a system that's built to allow you to play with the the different weights uh, and of the, of the consequences and, and those things, um, it can really make things quicker. And so it could be more um, appealing or, or less uh, prohibitive to think about risk when, when you have a tool, right? If, if you had to drill a hole by hand versus you get a little drill, it's suddenly not as big of a deal to mount that thing on the wall if you can you know, mm -hmm. get it done versus you know cranking a screwdriver. So uh, that's Liz to to go back to the original question, which was technology um, to assess and plan. Uh, that definitely a technology like risk manager uh, is is also super helpful. That's really insightful. So we're just about out of time, but Wayne, before you go, um, I just want to hear your favorite thing about risk manager and a feature of risk manager that you wish more people knew about? Well, my favorite thing is that it's finally in the hands of a large organization who has an enormous reach globally, who has, um, you know, clients across all major sectors who in many cases have risks that they are encountering every day. And, you know, so we, my, my hope is that, you know, we can put that tool in the hands of many to help people understand those risks and for them to take good risk-based decisions. So that's that's I guess my 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 big hope and, and upside for the tool. I think um I think what you're talking about there, Alex, was actually the risk profiler. So um the tool allows you to when you right up front when you first take a booking is have a, a, a series of questions that you're asking yourself about that particular booking based upon the information that you you know. Now that can be configured in 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 any way um, based upon the type of venue that you're at. But if you know, for example, have we had this event here before? Um, is there known to be you know large levels of intoxication, or that there's some type of crowd conflict or political? reputational risk or what are the things that are important to us that 
uh, make an event unsafe. And we can create this uh, weighted questionnaire, which allows us to evaluate that initially. Now, what does that mean? Well, we might decide that it's too risky an event and we can say no, or we can say yes, happy to, happy to bring it on. Let's you know, get their certificate of insurance and show them the keys, maybe. Or more likely is this is a high risk event, but it's gonna be good for us. And therefore we need our chief executive or, or our executive team to sign off on it. So again, using it to make good risk-based decisions or that it drives the security ratio. If we decide we're gonna bring it on, that it's a high risk event for us, we might need a one to 250 rather than a one to 500 ratio or one to a thousand. So again, depends upon the lens that you wanna apply, but at least what it does is gets people thinking right up front about what are the things that could adversely affect the success of this event. And that at the bottom line is that's what risk management's all about, right? It's about making events great. That's what we're trying to do. Fantastic. I think that that's a really great way to, to wrap it up. Wayne, thank you so much for spending time with us today. I know your time is super valuable um, and I hope that we are able to get together soon and dive more into some of these nuances in the future. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Joffrey. That was amazing. It was so great to be able to go back and listen to that conversation again. I picked up so many different things that I had not gotten a chance to pick up the first time. Ashley, uh, thanks for joining us. I hear that you have some questions. Yes, we have uh, three audience questions for today. The first one being, what's your philosophy on training event staff and risk management? That's a great one. Yeah, I think um, when we think about event staff is you think about your frontline folks. So you think about your uh, ticket takers, security officers, guest service representatives, uh, food and beverage. That's that's going to be the bulk of the folks that are engaging with uh, your guests. And so I think one of the important things it, when you think about training that team is that you train them on the relevant threats or hazards um, that they may encounter. So everybody's role will um, expose them to different different hazards. So for example, um, your custodial team is, is looking for your spills and um, they're moving about the building differently than the security team who may be posted in a particular location and only sees one section of the bowl in a stadium or only sees an entry point. So I think that being clear in, in your pre-event briefings in any sort of uh, pre-event um, trainings is to think about what the organizational risk assessment was, what hazards did, did that identify, and then what controls were put into place for specific hazards and brief those things that are relevant to the event staff. So one example would be for a security team that is assigned to the concourse area. A common uh, hazard is a, is a slip and fall or a trip and fall. So training that team to be on the lookout for suspicious behavior, for rowdy fans, for inappropriate behavior, those are all in line with what security does. But if we know that the most common hazard is a slip and fall or a trip and fall, then we should also train that team to be looking at the ground. Is Are there, are there wet spills? Um, are there are there is there debris on the ground from folks just dropping trash or um, is it is it are there cables running across something that are exposed? Uh, so training the event staff on relevant hazards or threats to them that may be outside of their their role, if you will, um, that that is I think going to be the most effective thing to make sure that the controls that we determined actually get implemented. Yeah, I think that that goes back to the idea of how do you use training to create a culture of safety where safety and identifying risk and reporting risks so that they can be mitigated, where that becomes everyone's responsibility as sort of like the baseline of, okay, what are we doing here? I also want to add, like, I'm a huge advocate for collecting feedback after training, right, to evaluate the training program holistically. So I think it's always a great tool to create a feedback mechanism that is accessible to the majority of your employees um, so that you can continuously improve upon the way that training is developed and delivered. 
Excellent. Thank you. Next question. How would you approach the challenge of keeping the audience safe while ensuring they have an enjoyable experience? Yeah, that is the that is the million dollar, trillion dollar question, probably, is how to balance the guest experience with uh, safety and security. And so really, the, the first step is to be collaborative about it. Um, so oftentimes, and this is in my experience as a security professional, oftentimes the 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 gut reaction is to say no or to say that's too risky or to say that's we're not going to do that because uh, it'll open up or it'll open ourselves up to liability or it's too difficult. And so uh, it's funny, Wayne and I had been talking about this and there's a phrase now that's stuck in my head that it's not about saying no and it's about figuring out how. Mm -hmm. So to figure out the how, how can we make uh, the guest experience streamlined and still be safe is it has to be collaborative. So security professionals aren't necessarily geared to think strictly about the guest experience, but guest experience folks have decades worth of experience in keeping people happy, making things fun um, and being creative about it. So if you get those groups of people together with event managers that are that are figuring out, you know, what the client implications are. If everybody's working together, it can be a much more creative solution that helps to strike that balance. The last uh, thing on that is that uh, Wayne talked about it as well, about, you know, if you if you try to do everything, it's going to be too restrictive. But then if you do nothing, then you open yourselves up to liability. So there is, there's, each event is different and there will, there will be a different sweet spot for every type of event, every type of demographic. Um, and, and the real the truest way to get to a good point is to be collaborative, collaborative about it and get all the stakeholders together to make that decision about what, what risk are we willing to take? What controls are, are acceptable um, to inconvenient or inconvenience our guests to this degree or that degree. And I think adding on to that, when you mentioned streamline to me, what that brings to my mind is that guests are able to either consciously or, or subconsciously perceive a consistent philosophy that is established across all of the different safety and security initiatives, right? So if they have a sense of being able to perceive the pattern and the approach and, and see the endpoint of these different systems, I feel like that will increase the tolerance for some of those inevitable inconveniences that we have to have in order to make the event safe. Right. And and to put that into a real world, real world example is the know before you go in, a, in an event email is so important to get folks, um, to give them the end state, right? So to your point, Liz, like, what's the end goal? Well, the end goal is you're gonna be sitting in your seat enjoying the basketball game or whatever it is. To get there, we'd love for you to bring a clear bag or no bag. We'd love for you to be prepared to get this type of screening. Be prepared to see this type of parking situation. All those things set the stage for the guests so that there's not ambiguity about things when they arrive. They're, they've already been prepped. They know what to expect, and then it's on us to to meet the the moment and and uh, implement those controls. Yeah, I think that I love that. I think that managing expectations is and always will be a foundation of any sort of customer service or client experience endeavor. Great, thanks, guys. Uh, last question: What is the single most important piece of advice you give to someone starting out in event safety or risk management? Um, yeah, so get started. Um, we all in in the event world, we all know some hazard, some threat is always keeping us up at night. There's for security folks, it's it's violence, uh, you know, the lone wolf attack, uh, those types of things. For potentially for guest services, it's a rogue employee making decisions on their own and and causing friction for our guests, um, not following company practices the the only way to to begin the process of effective risk management for an event is to get started and so what that means is taking those thoughts the the gut feelings about what could go wrong putting them down on paper and then the biggest piece is talking about them after the event so debriefing an event with your team figuring out what went wrong that's all extremely valuable data about what could go wrong in the future and then not shelving that and never looking at it again that's the opposite of what should happen. So if, if we're going to take the, the first step, which is to think through the hazards, think through what could go wrong, and then write down what did go wrong, 
how could we do a better job in the future? Then we should look at it again the next time we're going to have the same or similar event. And and that's the number one thing is is actually going about and, and beginning a formal formal process. And it doesn't have to be extremely robust. At the beginning, it can just be think about what, what could go wrong, document what did go wrong, um, look at it before you do it again. And and I think that's like the number one thing you can take out of how to get started. I think that that's fantastic. Um, so thank you everyone again for joining us today. Um, I really appreciate you spending your morning with us here at the Command Pod. Um, and we also want to thank Wayne again for joining us to share his incredible expertise. Um, please join us again next time on December 19th. Make sure you're signed up to receive all of our free event safety resources through Joffe. And um, that also includes now our new website, the Joffe Event Hub. It's our mission to share our best practices for health and safety and in turn, empower your events. Thank you again and be well.